a period that is considered the numismatic high point of Roman artistic achievement. This is from the AD 60s, with Nero's reopening of the revamped and probably reskilled mint of Rome after a hiatus of a decade or two. And it runs up to the AD 130s, almost to the end of the reign of Hadrian. This is not to say that uh, the similar format and themes continued of the carnage for many reigns thereafter, rather, <coughs> it is simply a period when a good deal of attention is paid to the engraving of sensitive portrayals of emperors and empresses in high relief and great detail. It is probably no coincidence that this uh, period is neatly bracketed by two emperors well known for their interests in the arts. On the other side of the coin, there is a marked uplift in the variety and innovation of reverse types. Dozens of reverse types could be employed per year. Uh, for example, uh, 15 reverse types across half a dozen denominations during Hadrian's first uh, full year of rule, which is 8. Most of these consist of the standard imperial virtue signaling, um, familiar, simple, allegorical uh, single figures, so virtus for courage or salus for well-being, that sort of thing. This rises up through more specific and useful historical references to, say, a homecoming here or a victory there. And to top it all, we have complex scenes involving buildings or uh, the emperor interacting with crowds of people. Of these latter, my favourites are the liberality scenes of the emperor engaging in naked popularity politics, distribu distributing dosh directly to the citizens with their full, full togas held out ready to receive. This particular uh, coin, the large brass coin, or Cistercius of Hadrian, carries a generic motto, Locupleta Tori Orbis Terrarum, enricher of the world, um, the circle of lands, Orbis Terrarum, uh, which is the name for the world. Uh, but we'll see others refer to more specific handout events, so the third liberality, the, the fourth liberality, etc. Thus, Hadrian handing out his money on his money is the subject of my talk. The thing from within the thing, or rather meta, perhaps. Uh, by the way, we shouldn't judge such boasts too harshly by modern political standards, uh, as we will see, it was entirely expe expected conduct in the bunch of Roma. Who does about that? Um, I've got a book to, uh, to publicise as well. Um, uh, it's been a privilege to be able to produce the modern typological catalogue for the coinage of one of these great uh, reigns of numismatic splendour. Here it is, RIC 2.3, it's in Latin and Arabic numerals, the Roman imperial coinage of Hadrian, uh, published in uh, 2019. I think now we can come closer, I hope, to matching Hadrian's coin types to historical events than previously. How the coin types are laid down in relative order is discussed in the introduction of the paper catalogue itself, but if you trust me, there's a free and very easily searched version online, ochre of online coinage of the Roman Empire. So, for example, we can put into the context the six or seven largest scenes that we will see depicted upon Adrianic coinage. So, the uh, website address is just down the bottom. That's the cover of the book there. Ancient authors give a more balanced view, perhaps, of Hadrian, uh, as if you're a baddie, and we who might imagine today very often assumed is easily one of the great spy Roman standards. Uh, Cassius Dio here tells us that he avoided war, almost an expensive business in Russian treasure, and diverted his resources into reigning magnificently. Munificence and magnificence, the Romans were in no doubt that splashing cash to the extent of just giving it away was a good thing. Notice also that he didn't much need to extract the funds in the first place from the Roman rich. As we will see, he was a plush emperor. So um, he deprived no one of money unjustly, and followed on uh, many communities and provinces and senators and knights, he bestowed large sums. <coughs> now, actually, we have an ancient league table of imperial giveaways. <laughs> 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 I discovered this quite recently, when near the end of the, uh, the roof. 
Uh, the chronography of AD 354, which is quite obscure, but it's nicely illustrated, if you ever get to see it, you put up some extra slides on that. But as its name suggests, the chronographer, as we call it from the law, was writing a long time after the fact, by a couple of centuries. Uh, add to this the uh, probability uh, of transmission errors, especially when the false numbers almost does, and the problems do mount up. Uh, we can notionally construct a per citizen payment, or uh, really just a head of the citizen family, uh, called the recipient, and per citizen, per citizen per recipient's total for the reigns on the side of Hadrian in the currency of the denarius, the principal silver coinage uh, of the empire. So it's about the size of five bets. We'll see one in a bit. From the end of the reign of the first emperor, Augustus, a standard handout amount of 75 denarii seems to have been established. This corresponds to the thrice annual military stipend for the legionary uh, of the same amount up to the reign of Domitian. So uh, three lots of 75 in the year giving 225 denarii. The citizen handouts seem to lag behind the increase in army pay thereafter, but by the Antonine period, there, um, it conceivably seems to match the subsequent current 100 denarii uh, military stipend, 300 denarii per year. Thus, the distributed amounts for Domitian and Nerva, top two there, seem quite consistent and understandable, and likewise uh, on the other side of that the earlier Antonine period, that will return to the more difficult picture in between. This picture. So, the engravers of the coinage minutes of Rome, or people who dictated what they were engraving, were only interested in the handout, handouts made when the emperor was at Rome distributing to the citizens of Rome. But the emperor wasn't always in Rome, certainly not Hadrian who was famous for his travels, of course. Hadrianic coinage includes a wonderful series of the emperor visiting many of the empire's provinces, as well as its frontier garrisons. For example, uh, Hadrian drawing up in front of the army of uh, Mauritania. Fortunately, one such visit was recorded for us in great detail at Ambysus, now uh, being Alexandria. It was then the base of Lake Three Augusta, which had a number of satellite auxiliary units in its orbit. And um, just to show the main picture there, the famously complete Principia or headquarters building at the centre of the fortress, post Hadrianic, but it gives a good impression of what must have been a magnificent site. The massive inscription was around the base of the Columbia Monument in the middle of the training ground. Delineated by uh, a wall there. It recorded his speeches in response to a sort of durbar of events, if you like, uh, throughout the part of the summer of AD 128, of July, I think. In addition to the legionaries on parade, there were auxiliaries engaged in cavalry sports, archery, and there was even a wall building demonstration. The Fragmentary condition led the definitive publication was as recent as 2006 by Spidell. This is a sketch of its original condition as found in bits and pieces. All about the base for the panels. Now the inscription begins with his greeting as the most generous of emperors. I'm not sure I pronounce that, but it includes the word liberality, liberalitas, as you can see. And that as the regiments have put through their paces on successive days, money is then handed out at the end of each pep talk. Accept a largesse, the usual parting words, congiarium, accepter. Interestingly, this included non citizen auxiliary soldiers, whereas previously we had suspected they were left out of such gifting. When we given the lower handout reflecting their stipendia at four fifths of the legionary rate, the inscription can tell us that sadly. Hadrian's coinage enumerates seven liberalities to the citizens at Rome. Perhaps being a newbie, he got a bit carried away initially. We hear he had already given a double donors to the troops 
uh, in the Peter Hadriani in Scriptura Historia Augusta, SHA, uh, and then he did the same for the citizens when he arrived at Rome the summer after his accession in the Maid. But this was only after the Senate had actually made a single largesse in his name while he was away. <coughs> Uh, I'm not quite sure if this first handout was made up to a double, or a second double handout was given on top of a single, which consisted, as we can see here, of three gold arrows, three gold pieces, again about the size of the eyes, but gold. Um, uh, three gold pieces make 75 denarii in the Roman uh, exchange rate of gold silver coins, on arrows is 25 denarii. The problem is, Neither way quite matches the chronographer's arrangement for Hadrian of a thousand denarii per recipient of the course of the reign. So it's easy to get back to the five or thousand fifteen. Uh, my RIC table of Hadrian's liberalities, um, I went for the assumption first meted by Adam Berkham in 1939 that it was actually 975 denarii. Just be rounded up by the chronographer. That would entail doubles all the way after a single initial handout. Note aside a problem with the second liberality, um, like the dash there, um, and a suspicion that when we see liberalities for the first time on Hadrianic coinage in 118, it actually represents both 1 and 2 combined. So this is that Sesterius of that 118 cost 2, easily. Dateable, uh, there's no enumeration, um, but it's a practical scene handout in progress. There is perhaps kind of ghost liberality, not enumerated again, uh, and it seemingly occurs on the coinage combining the third consulship, which was taken in 118, but it's prior, and we'll see uh, other secrets. Uh, with the unambiguous Liberatus III type, which occurred a couple of years later. The problem, the problem with this is it is, in fact, a vanishingly rare type and associated with an equally rare as possible events or arrivals in the Emperor greeting uh, Roma. Hadrian had already arrived in Rome the previous year, in the summer of 1998. Possibly it's a case of production lines of the mint turning out the same type until told otherwise. It's used. You can see the third Liberalitas, you've got Liberalitas, all three is ambiguous. Now, Hadrian utters the term congiarium, distribution, but his coinage describes it as Liberalitas. The terms are in fact interchangeable. Congiarium held sway in the coinage of the Trajan. And subsequently, an antimony type, so it's labelled both ways. So, Trajan Sturtius Pungiarium Tertium motto. Below we have Antonius Pius, and it's Liberalitas O, I think that's four. But another point of Darius this time of Antonius Pius, Liberalitas personified with Kong O nine. So, you can go either way. Liberalitas herself is the personification of generosity. She is often to be seen on the imperial platform in distribution scenes holding the attributes of Horde Penty and Coinscape, which you can see very nicely on the woman's uh, arrays. Uh, some older numismatic groups call this thing erroneously an abacus, which is be the idea behind it being that you keep track of the handout in some way. But it's clearly wrong. Uh, a glance at such a scene depicted in the Arch of Constantine above there uh, will show that there's, there's scooping and dropping activity quite clearly. Um, I do like the alternative scene of, uh, on the surface on the left, where she's symbolically making the distribution of herself by pouring out the horn of plenty to the waiting recipient. Nice contrast between uh, the reality at the top and the supernatural at the bottom. Actually, we only happen to know about the purpose and the total cost to the Emperor for Hadrian's final handout, Liberalitas VII. 
This is a throwaway line in the SHA, where Hadrian rues his expensive adoption of the sickly Aelius, who died before he could succeed him. The handout was to mark the adoption, and the cost was 75 million denarii, expressed uh, in SHA in Cisterci, the Lord of nation being more than a quarter of denarius, hence 300 million Cisterci. We can also tell that it was Hadrian's last handout, as the other SHA quote that's relevant here uh, suggests Antoninus had to find his own. The latter point has often been overlooked, but the order of the coinage confirms the rise of seven comes in no less than 136. There's no debate. Images of Aeneas and Antoninus there. To get the full picture of why an emperor gave largesse to people, we need to look back to the first emperor, Augustus himself, who very conveniently left an autobiography, uh, the famed Res Geste, uh, which was set up as an inscription for the emperor. We can tabulate upon the area, it's called then, uh, and see that uh, we have handouts for accession, 75 denarii there, various triumphs. Uh, for Egypt, 100 denarii, and in Spain, another 100, most of 100 denarii. Uh, changes of air, death of Hippo, prompting that in 12 BC, so another 100 denarii. Uh, and even minor ones, the coming of age of heirs, Gaius Lucius, 60 apiece. <coughs> and a further triumph at the end of the reign uh, in Germany. The price per recipient fluctuates with the rain, as you can see. Augustus was clearly flush with the wealth of Egypt. But that seems to settle down at the end of the rain to the expected 75 denarii, even though it was a big triumph, uh, and that mostly carries through the first century. <coughs> However, to return to the fourth century chronographer, we see his total for Augustus' well-off mark, actually 570 denarii per season, but he has it down as thrice times 362.5. The sum also seems very odd for Caligula too, just to give an interesting example. Uh, so we know from uh, the inscription known as the Fasti Ostienses that Caligula gave two handouts of 75 denarii and not the chronometer of 72 and a half. Uh, the chronographer also paints a bizarre picture of Caligula starting an undignified and lethal strangle, killing men, women, and non binary. It sounds more akin to the late Roman practice of Sparsio and Sicilia, as the bits on his contemporary uh, fourth century coin of Constantius II. All rather anachronistic. Um, just to continue, it's worth bearing in mind that we're talking about the most basic sum. Well, the basic sum for the most humble recipient. Dialogues earlier and probably more <coughs> credible history notes uh, that for Claudius, we get some elite citizens who get multiples of that basic 75 denarius period uh, by over four times as much. Another chronographer error assigns a great tax write off to Marcus Aurelius, supposedly having. Uh, uh, Old tax receipts. Uh, debtors uh, burned in the Roman Forum for 30 days, seems a long time. But the burning of outstanding tax receipts in the Forum actually occurred uh, under Hadrian, quite famously. Here is 119 and 120, burning the third consulship. Hadrian's deed was commemorated on the monumental as well as numismatic art and inscriptions. We can see Roman soldiers did the heavy lifting, imperial lictures did the torching. The mob loved it. Uh, as you can see in the coin there, the lictor in front of the Dorian crowd. But then who wouldn't like their debts forgiven? Um, and the piece of monumental stonework is now preserved at Chatsworth House. If you get the chance to see it, you can see the soldiers with the boxes and tax receipts in them. Now, the amount of debt being given, because the total of the coin is um, uh, 900 million sesterces, that's the mark of the sesterces, it seems like an H and an S combined. Um, that was triple 
triple the physical payment Adrian was seemingly used to making, if we think of the Browns of seven. But then again, this is only virtual money. Uh, most of them could have lost bad debt anyway. <coughs> so, in the absence of historical explanations, we can only guess what some of Hadrian's liberalities, betwixt and between his first and his final, might have been about. Liberalitas III occurs on coinage interlinked with a superdatable type of 1821, April 1821, in fact, uh, because uh, uniquely uh, in the Roman series, the, the year is given in the era of Rome at Rodeus Condita, and in Rome, the year 874, uh, which equals 121 AD. <coughs> Turn in herds as metals, what's the uh, as well as gold here, this one. Uh, and the type itself promotes circus games uh, being held on the date of Rome's birthday, and that gets more of us Max Burroughs, which is about the next top. Uh, we have a genius or a spirit holding a chariot wheel and clutching around the obelisks that decorated the spine of the Hippodrome, which appears well with this terracotta plaque of the activity itself going on. Other coin types in that group um, uh, show that the largesse is also related to its wider rebranding of the reign as a new golden age, all occurring at the time of Adrian's fifth anniversary. He was seemingly moving out of the shadow of his illustrious <coughs> predecessor, Trajan. Here's one with a depiction of the spirit of golden age himself, eternal youth with eternal symbols, ever the ever renewed phoenix. And the perpetual loop of the zodiac, we we'll just make that thing. Scorpio, either. <coughs> What's about the Morales has four? Uh, this is a type uh, illustrated by sort of fun supernatural sprinkling from the Morales has four plenty. It's way more than three hours in there. Uh, well, it links magnificently. Uh, with a uh, link to a magnificent type actually of uh, showing Hadrian back at Rome, probably after his first great expedition, which had set off shortly after his proclamation of this new golden age in 121, heading for Britain the following year, 122, of course. Um, but we know he didn't return until probably around the summer of 125, so that's clearly the uh, start of the scene showing. You can just about spot that. I think that the, the two busts are stamped from the same die. The top one's not in terribly good condition. So it does show, demonstrate that link between the two. Closer look at it. It's perhaps Hadrian's most elegant uh, crowd scene, but it remains ambiguous. Is he dedicating the temple, which acts as a backdrop there? Something on the rostrum there in the forum? Maybe. We don't really know. The people have written a lot about it. The simplest explanation is this is a rare, full on depiction of an imperial uh, event or arrival at Rome, with the emperor appearing before his adoring people. This is opposed to the stock reverse type given on this contemporary little uh, half gold, uh, gold areas, which shows the usual uh, visual radiation of Roma greeting the emperor. As the travelling emperor, Adrian had a number of long time ago sea returns that could have been part with official largesse at Rome. We know so much nowadays of the chronology of those expeditions from the body of well based military diplomas as are continually turning up by the architecture. Finally, these took the form of duplicated legal tablets that were passed as bronze plaques to be kept, and as treasury for the status had conferred. Each one marked the retirement and social elevation of a soldier. They carry far better dated titulature than on the contemporary coinage, including the title of Procos, Consul, when the Emperor was outside Italy. So indeed, mm -hmm. the Moralites V could, could, could coincide with the return from Lambaitis in 128, and the Moralites VI 
is certainly associated through dialects with the um, coinage marking his final adventus, which we now know was in 133, when he became too infirm to make further for John Jonas. But although a return is the opportunity for Hadrian, unlike Lord Augustus, we will never know the headline reason for most of these liberalities. So I think this struck out of focus on is from uh, the year of his visit, I think, to Britain. So it's uh, TRP 6, cos 3, and Coke uh, was there. So we have seen that Hadrian was top of the splurging leaderboard, but where did his wealth come from? This is proportionately speaking across its emperors were all rich, but it's no secret that it was down to his predecessor Trajan, the great conqueror. Like Hadrian, the sums for Trajan revealed by the chronographer don't quite add up. 650 denarii are given over three liberalities uh, of Congaria, still described at this point, but there is a really good theory for this. What if the first two were just those standard amounts of 75 denarii? That would be the big third, Congiarium Tertium, coin motto, uh, and it's commemorated on the coinage from around the time of Trajan's triumph and return from Dacia. So the 500 denarii payout seems ridiculous, but then, um, you know, just one typo, if you like, from the geographer to transfer the numeral D for 500 from what was intended as the numeral C, for example, for 100. C for 100 would be, would be a worthy parallel sum to Augustus' handout uh, on the sack of uh, Egypt. But then again, not necessarily, since Trajan's bounty seems limitless when we consider it. To start with a more modest public spending scheme, the Alimenta, or Child Benefit, which is first commemorated in Trajan's crimes, was sustainably funded from the interest return on state loans. Only children, citizen children of Italy, uh, received the payment, just to boost their birth rate, uh, despite reduced funding for girls, the entire 16 sisters, the mother of boys, and only 12 girls. And this is a magnificent panel from the uh, Arch of Trajan Benevento. Uh, it appears in Trajan's coinage. Um, the chronographer seems to suggest it starts under Nerva, but then that seems to be a mistake because there's no evidence for that. However, the sustainable Alimenta was the exception to Trajan's spending pro projects. The source of his funds is generally accepted as being the Lutetia. We have one throwaway remark in the writings of the Emperor's personal physician. Crito, uh, that it consisted of five million pounds by weight of gold and further ten million pounds of silver. You can, of course, convert that into known amounts of Roman gold and silver coins, and when you convert that into the equivalent sesterce, millions become billions. If you remember the 300 million sesterce cost of Adrian's Liberata 7, uh, well, uh, it appeared to be good doctor's word, which Trajan's lost a lot of biography. The Dacian loot would have paid for that 160 times over. And there's a famous scene on Trajan's column of the loot of Dacia being carried away. <clears throat> of course, not all the ill gotten gains from Dacia were spent on liberalities. Just think of the amazing expansion to the monumental centre of Rome and the Trajan and Hadrian. Uh, Trajan's Forum, with its twin libraries and central focus of the column, uh, uh, displaced traders housed in vast shopping centre complex nearby, cut into the hillside. I could have shown uh, the, things like the vast double temple of Venus in Rome, uh, of Hadrian, and the vast pantheon. Um, uh, and really, you want to see, you see the extent, extent of the expansion uh, in your plan. You can see Trajan's Forum, with the market cut into the hillside above, uh, is at least twice as big as any of its neighbouring predecessors. You can well understand why it's called Trajan the Wallflower in later times due to the <coughs> proliferation of his monumental building works in Rome. Hadrian certainly inherited a patent to treasury, and who knows what Trajan's fourth life largesse would have been like had he lived. Hadrian therefore had the opportunity to build for the public 
and of course for himself, in the form of his vast pleasure villa at Tivoli, if you think about it. He could travel widely and pacify the empire, and had plenty of opportunity to lavish his money on the people he met on his visits, as well as upon his returns to Rome. Lucky emperor indeed. The splurging of liberality seems blatant in our eyes, but it's been an established statecraft, as we saw from the start, the empire under Augustus. And finally, just to leave you with a kind of connection to Hadrian's Wall, uh, since the subject of today's, this year's anniversary, if you like, Hadrian visited Britain in 122. Shortly afterwards, the British Legion started their work on the wall. Uh, and this is one of uh, the most popular, <coughs> to my mind, uh, Hadrianic hordes from Britain. 28 silver denarii uh, in a bronze arm purse found on the rampart backing at Bird Oswald, which is in the first phase of the wall's construction. Now in the Tully House Museum in Carlisle, it very nicely runs up to the eve of the post construction start date of AD 122. <coughs> One is about 120. Uh, I fond fondly like to imagine it slipping off a soldier's arm during the frenzy of construction work, <laughs> but no, it's much more likely simply a, a foundation deposit, not least because soldiers have kind of money in belt arrangement rather than his arm purses, as far as we know. Like at Lambysis, Hadrian must have declaimed Congiarium Accipiter. British garrisons that met and entertained them in the summer of 122. It's fun to imagine that some of that local splurging ended up on and indeed under Hadrian's Wall. Thank you. <laughs>